Welcome back to Think Tech. Uh, this is Think Tech Asia on Think Tech. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. It's the three o'clock block. Our show today is called North Korea, Threat or Paper Tiger? And uh, we're going to talk about North Korea as a legitimate threat or not. And we're going to address the question of whether actually uh, DPRK, what is that? Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Okay, is a threat. If you want to ask a question, participate in the discussion, you can. Um, you can tweet us at ThinkTechHI or call us at 415-871-2474. So if you haven't noticed, our guest for the show, smile, is Patrick <laughs> W. Border, a citizen diplomat who knows a lot about it. So the secretaries of state and defense both say the Democratic Party of Korea, DRPK, is a threat. So why is that? Are we entering dangerous territory where we have never been before? What is the North Korean game plan that keeps the, the Kims in power for so long? Are there sanctions which Trump could uh, impose on China which have not been undertaken before? Can um, DPRK really drop a nuke on U.S. citizens? Pat Porter is going to address those questions and more on Think Tech Asia today. So welcome to the show, Patrick W. Porter. Nice to have you here with us again, Jay. talking about our favorite subject. Always oh, nice to be here. Thank you and for inviting me. <laughs> yeah. Well, you have you know, remained interested in North Korea. You've made six trips there. You're going to make another one. And I hope you don't get arrested and detained the way that guy did yesterday in North Korea. Every American is a possible detainee, isn't he? I think that's a possibility. And so I'm looking cautiously at when to return again. But uh, I think they know me by now, and they know that I follow the rules. There's I hope so, there, Pat. There is enough interesting to see without breaking any of the rules. I'm not yeah. going to go in and tear up my passport. I'm not going to go in and... and bring a bunch of Bibles with me. I'm not going to try to proselytize to people. Uh, I'm just going to show up and have a good time there. The, the coming trip, I hope to see their iconic location, Mount Pektu, which is a frozen crater lake that's way up by the Chinese border. And it is so significant in uh, Korean lore that even the South Koreans have it mentioned in their national anthem. Amazing stuff. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Shades, shades of years gone by when the Koreas were together. Yes. And I mean, that's something you and I have talked about, um, but it just seems more remote these days. But let me, let me uh, go on our agenda here. So, um, you know, are we in a place more dangerous now? Should I be waking up in the morning and looking west for a blinding flash? Um, is North Korea... <laughs> Is North Korea, you know, got its gun sights on us, really? Wake up at your normal hour <laughs> tomorrow morning and do not worry. Uh, Chicken Little has been around for a long time. The sky is not falling. Um, the thing that I would tell you that should be reassuring is this. The North Koreans are great at brinksmanship. And if you look back over history, we practiced some brinksmanship, too. Back in the day when Dwight Eisenhower was inaugurated as president in 1953. He was the seasoned World War II general, uh, the reassuring presence on the scene. Behind him was his Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, who had been instructed uh, to let fly the notion that um, if things didn't go our way, we weren't afraid to use nuclear weapons as a form of coercion. And that was a ter particularly applied to the Chinese. This was a period of time when people were scared to death, that China went communist, and the blame was flying left, right, and center. A lot of the China hands got fired, not because they were wrong. In fact, they, they were fired precisely because their predictions that Chiang Kai-shek uh, would not survive as the leader of China, their predictions were correct, so they all got fired. Well, you know, it's interesting that if you look for danger, increased danger, 
I'm not sure that you find that Kim Jong-un is more dangerous, say, than he was six months or a year ago. He's equally dangerous, um, maybe a little provoked. But then you have to look at our side of the equation. You have to look at Donald Trump. Donald Trump is more dangerous, I think. And so, if, you know, if you're looking for a formula to evaluate danger, Donald Trump is uh, the more dangerous of the two in terms of escalating the discussion, don't you think? It's a fascinating hypothesis, but I would say no. We send flotillas through uh, the Persian Gulf all the time, much closer to land and much closer to conflict with a much more powerful Iran uh, than we have with uh, North Korea. Uh, if I had to interpret what, uh, what Trump is doing right now and his heavy reliance upon his military advisors, um, I think uh, by sending an aircraft carrier and, and a whole, that whole team of, of uh, ships that go along with an aircraft carrier, what they call a task force, um, he wants to illustrate something, and that is precisely that he can hover in the waters off of North Korea without seriously um, risking attack. Uh, everything about the uh, North Korean nuclear program is demonstrated that they are practicing brinksmanship. Uh, if they fire another rocket, the world does react as though the sky was falling, even though it's clearly not. The last two or three rockets that the North Koreans fired all blew up on the pad. So perhaps the strongest hypothesis is that the place you don't want to be after a, a missile firing by the North Koreans is North Korea. on the pad, okay? <laughs> well, you know, a number of people have suggested that these um, these um, failures on the pad and the failures in the air and all, you know, all the almost almost funny, um, you know, the slapstick thing, things that happen where these rockets fall out of the air and they don't work and they blow up on the pad and all this. Or, or, they, it, or they end up getting misdirected to the Philippines. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is, is, it's funny, but, but I, you know, the, you, you keep hearing that the U.S. Uh, you know, military is hacking into their system and creating this kind of mischief. Well, you hear about hacking in both directions, and that is a very serious topic that is a little bit separate right now. Um, I think all of the countries of the world are, are worried about hacking and the ability of a third world power to hack into U.S. Uh, financial resources and, and tear the country apart. We, because we're the most technologically advanced country, are the most susceptible to hacking. So I don't think that's a dynamic that's going on here. What's happening is, um, whether wise or not, and I'm not, I'm not suggesting that I'm a fan of Trump, because I'm not, but um, I would say to you that by um, bringing up the issue with the Koreans, he wants to illustrate a point that I think his military advisors know, and that is, there's two things that are necessary to launch a nuclear attack against another country that's any f distance away, like the United States. The first thing you need is a rocket which can propel its own weight up to the edge of the atmosphere so that it can follow the curve of the atmosphere and then descend in a ballistic, it's a, not an orbit, but it's a ballistic path which would put it into Hawaii or Seattle or San Francisco, Chicago, New York or Washington. These are all cities that Kim Jong-un has threatened at one time or another. Can they do it? Uh, the record clearly shows they cannot and that um, the real risk is not the boys' toys that they have, but it's our reaction to them. Well, yeah, so there's a couple of thoughts that come to mind. I mean, <clears throat> so, you know, Rex Tillerson uh, has made some very provocative comments uh, about North Korea, and he's really pushed the rhetoric, uh, perhaps more than, you know, you, you would expect. Um, and there must be a point, there must be a point, I'd like your advice on this, there must be a point where Kim Jong-un will crack. He'll say, I'm not going to tolerate this anymore. I'm going to push the button. Uh, it, what is that point? What is that scenario? I, I think it won't happen, and I'll tell you why. In order to believe that Kim Jong-un is truly, as some people would say, a nut, you have to believe, in effect, that three generations of North Korean leaders were all 
crazy. Either that or they had a method to their madness. And the more likely um, explanation is that they're playing brinksmanship uh, and they have uh, succeeded over the years at doing that and gaining concessions from the United States and South Korea. Uh, beginning about 2000, you had two presidents in a row who followed the sunshine policy in Korea, and that was engage. Uh, Kim Dae-jung was the first of them. No Mu Hyun, who replaced him, was the second. And uh, each of those presidents wanted badly to meet with the North Korean leaders, and they paid dearly for it. And they wanted to have a show, and what they got is exactly that, a show and nothing more. For hundreds of millions of dollars in South Korean won, they got the privilege of driving <laughs> from the DMZ all the way that hour and a half drive on the bumpy roads all the way up to the, the great city of Pyongyang where they had a big show and met with uh, either Kim Jong-il, uh, yeah, it was Kim Jong-il for both of them, and they had a big show. And then after that, what happened? Absolutely nothing. It was a waste of time. But it was something that the South Koreans had to try. Uh, they had uh, faced toe-to-toe -to -toe with the North Koreans, and belligerence had been the order of the day. And so they gave peace a chance, and I give them credit for that. But it got them nowhere. And so um, it's, it's certainly not inappropriate to consider a different approach. What, what's the plan, though? He, I mean, he's just been provocative, seems to me. Uh, for the sake of being provocative, and all three generations of, of them have been provocative for the sake of being provocative. What does he get out of this? It's in, a, in a way, it's like the mouse that roared with Peter Sellers way back yeah. when. It was, what does he want, attention? Does he want foreign aid? What does he want? He wants concessions, and they're, they have all been operating off of the same script. Whenever the incumbent dear leader or great leader or young general whatever you want to call them in any given era, takes over, uh, they're the designated Brinksman. And they take uh, their opponents to the very edge of what appears to be war, and they gain concessions from it. And then for a while, there's an easy period where they talk of friendship and all, and then it reverts back to they'll make Seoul a lake of fire, those sorts of things. Can they do it? Should we treat them as a joke? No. But should we treat them as though the sky is falling and that we will, in fact, go to a nuclear war? Not by a long shot. We should not be doing that. There well, are there are available uh, financial pressure points which could be put on um, North Korea and also China uh, to stop. Uh, well, for, Trump for tried that, didn't he? He tried no, that. No, he hasn't been in office long enough. If, if you think he's going to fail, maybe he will, but, <laughs> but not in three months. Um, basically, when, when Trump met with Xi Jinping there at Mar-a-Lago about a month ago, the message to uh, President Xi was this. He said, in an earlier time, we were able to shut off money to North Korea because back in the 90s, they were counterfeiting U.S. $100 bills and floating them in the system. And it was a major source of profit to North Korea until uh, the Treasury Department for the United States stepped in and put all of the banks in Macau off limits. They said, you will not deal in the American financial system at all. And so they shut that off. That was a very effective form of sanction, and it didn't risk war at all. Yeah. What, let me tell you what, what I believe Trump told Xi Jinping. He said, look, um, the uh, UN has banned coal shipments uh, from North Korea, saying that the Koreans cannot make money by selling coal to the Chinese, which is a major source of revenue for the North Koreans. So what happens to make that, uh, that sale occur anyway? Now the Chinese banks get involved with it. And for the past four previous administrations, the Bushes, Clinton, and Obama, all four of them, have basically said, look, we've got enough problems with Iraq and the Middle East and the Israelis and Palestinians and all the rest of it. Let's keep this on the back burner. And they have succeeded in doing just that. All of them have to a point. They considered it to be a containable problem, and they dealt with it as such, and they succeeded to that extent. What you can expect from Trump, which is different, is 
that Trump will go after the financial resources of North Korea, and if necessary, he will uh, boycott uh, and, the, and the Treasury Department will boycott the Chinese banks. Not all of China, and is it enough to start a trade war? I think not, but now, now Trump is practicing a little brinksmanship of his own. He's telling Xi that if your banks facilitate these agreements where the North Koreans can sell coal to the, the Chinese, then we will take steps against the banks that do that so that they are, they are banned uh, from any deals with the United States banking system. We have enough clout in our banking system so that we can cripple any bank which we put off limits to American business. And, mm. I think, and I think that's what's happening now. And, you know, it happens in a very congenial situation. They're all in South Florida, and they've got arms around one another and all. But Trump is, he's upping the ante, but not in a military sense. He's not going to send um, a, a carrier task force into an area where the Koreans can blow it out of the water. That, that is not the method of his madness, but you're seeing reverse brinksmanship on our part uh, now through him. The art of the negotiation, like it, don't like it, I really don't care, but that's what's being practiced right now, and yeah. we'll see with the passage of the months whether it works or not. I will see more about this conversation after this break. That's uh, Patrick W. Border, uh, an informed uh, citizen and, in fact, a, a citizen diplomat. Uh, all around North Korea, we're discussing exactly what's happening there, whether they are a paper tiger or a serious one. We'll be right back. You're watching Think Tech Hawaii, which streams live on thinktechhawaii.com, uploads to youtube.com, and broadcasts on cable OC16 and Alelo 54. Great content for Hawaii from Think Tech. You're watching Think Tech Hawaii, Hawaii's leading digital media platform for civic engagement, raising public awareness on tech, energy, diversification, and globalism. Great content for Hawaii from Think Tech. This guy looked familiar. He calls himself the Ultra Fan, but that doesn't explain all this. Why? Why? He planned this party, planned the snacks, he even planned to coordinate colored shirts, but he didn't plan to have a good time. Go, go, go. Now you wouldn't do this in your own house, so don't do it in your team's house. Know your limits and plan ahead so that everyone can have a good time. Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. Uh, here we are on Think Tech Asia with uh, Patrick W. Border, who is a citizen diplomat who um, believes, I think, did I get this right, that uh, North Korea is not as much of a threat as we think. North Korea should be taken seriously. It is not the nuclear threat that the talking heads on both conservative and liberal sides uh, project. Uh, the, uh, the sky is not falling, and it won't be anytime soon. You think there's a scenario where they would drop a bomb somewhere? I mean, for example, if, um, if the United States uh, did put a carrier group offshore, or if the United States attacked some, some kind of um, um, shipping from North Korea or some North Korean outpost, uh, and Kim Jong-un decided this, this would justify his uh, reaction. Wouldn't he do that? Wouldn't he push the button? Wouldn't he f sail a bunch of rockets into Seoul, nuclear or otherwise, to well, show how big a guy he is? That's several questions. The risk to Seoul has to be taken separately because uh, his heavy cannon fire and even some uh, incursion into South Korea can cause damage and loss of life and injury uh, in Seoul. But remember back to the Gulf War, what stays his hand? Why would he not do that? If you remember back to the time when um, we were stationed in uh, Saudi Arabia and we had our cruise missiles and we had 30 days of shock and awe. And what was that? 30 days of shock and awe meant that without putting a single soldier into Iraq, we would cripple their system. We would make them blind militarily. We would knock out all of the, the, um, uh, the tanks in the desert. And then after they were seriously weakened, then at a time of our choosing, 
we would invade with people, and mm -hmm. that's exactly what we did. We have the cruise missiles that can travel 50 feet off the ground and make, and I, I hope to God this does not happen, so please don't take it as an as advocacy, but if they want to damage Seoul, we can make powdered sand out of Pyongyang because you can you can fire those missiles. They're deadly accurate, um, and if Kim Jong Un wants to stay a hundred feet underground and try to rule this country, three months after he's been deposed uh, and that regime no longer exists, well, he can do whatever he wants. Saddam Hussein tried that, and when they finally caught up with him, it didn't work very well. But but Jay, um, we have the capacity despite the fact that we're a hundred miles away from Pyongyang and they're 25 miles away from Seoul, we have the capacity, the South Koreans and the United States, to do far more damage with uh, non-nuclear um, assault weapons like the ones we used on Saddam Hussein <coughs> over 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So that's why... Um, no, the problem is... That's, why, like they're, that's why the, their hand has stayed from invading souls. But this is all uncomfortable. I mean, just as he intends it to be uncomfortable, it is uncomfortable. Because you know that when you have provocation <coughs> and when you have a buildup and when you have all these threats and machinations, it increases the chances that somebody will make a mistake. A mistake in judgment, a mistake in equipment, a mistake in delegation of authority, what have you. And that's how wars so often start. That's how World War I started. It was actually silly at the beginning, and all of a sudden everybody in Europe was involved in a conflagration. Um, the same here. I mean, if somebody makes a mistake on this, some, somebody even without authority makes a mistake, all of a sudden the other guys are going to respond, and then you have an escalation. And these days, with these weapons, an escalation would take minutes, and all of a sudden you have nuclear. You're, you're, uh, well, all of a sudden you have conflict. Um, you asked, would Kim Jong Un push the button? Yeah. I don't think he has a button to push. Okay. <laughs> you heard it here on Think Tech. <laughs> yeah, you heard you heard it here first, but I believe it. I believe it strongly. Uh, he needs two things in order to deliver a bomb to a target. The first is he needs a bomb, and he hasn't demonstrated. You know, he blows off huge huge amounts of TNT underground, and most of the experts said. Uh, when he recently uh, blew up TNT underground, that it was meant to simulate a hydrogen bomb, which is even more powerful than an atomic bomb, but it was still fake. Okay, so the first so, thing. Uh, okay, I heard it here on Think Tank. It's fake. The we, first we, thing, we, we thought okay. he was blowing up nuclear weapons underground. It was not. Yeah. Well, we haven't seen any fallout from the nuclear weapons, and there's always some. Yeah. And that's another answer to why you'd never see a nuclear attack on Seoul because it's mutually assured, assured destruction, which means that the fallout from the bomb launched in North Korea would drift back into North Destroy Korea. Destroy the whole peninsula. And it, it would strike the whole peninsula and it would kill millions of innocent North Koreans. All of whom are related <laughs> some that, way. Well, okay, I mean, it's, we can all laugh about it, but let me, let me say to you, all of whom for my many visits there are genuine human beings that I've come to like. Uh, it's it's a uh, it's a dictatorship, which means that the average citizen has no vo voice in what's going on. And I believe very fervently that North Koreans are waiting to be rescued from what they have now learned through all this tourism. Yeah. And, and all from what they have learned is a world in which they are not participating. Yeah. They oh, now have. Side, we got to cover that in the remaining time, Pat. Yeah. You know, is what he is doing sustainable vis-a-vis -vis his own citizens, his own country? Is, is somebody going to take a run at him? Are his military going to stick around and remain loyal? Are the people, you know, going to be docile while he beats them up and spends all the money on nuclear weapons? Um, wh wh how, how is this going to play out? Forgetting about arguments with Rex Tillerson and Donald Trump, forgetting about escalation, just him and his people. How long can that last? Because it's not going well. Well, if you look back to other similar situations in Asia, the thing that, um, that is a problem in North Korea is that there really isn't a tipping point. If you look at Marcos back in the Philippines, for instance, there were options and that uh, fatal election where um, he, whether he beat Corazon Aquino or lost to her really doesn't make any difference because 
uh, the world said Corazon is president and the tank operators would not fire on their own people. So where is the tipping point for North Korea? Is there an alternative to Kim Jong-un? I would say no. I don't think there is. And that's what makes it a more difficult problem. And that's the reason why financial starvation is the answer to how to deal with North Korea. So we have to tighten up on the Chinese banks that are funding, for instance, the shipments of coal that keep the North Korean regime in power. I think those people are ready at an instant's notice if things turn against them to go live the rest of their lives in Switzerland. Uh, and they could do it. Kim uh, Jong-un. Kim Jong-un already lived a part of his life in Switzerland and uh, they, they could live happy lives outside the country. So how the is reason, this all? See, part of the reason that the Chinese don't want to cooperate with us is because ever since Mao's time, but continuing throughout, they have always wanted a, a weak buffer state so that they don't have U.S. soldiers and U.S. sympathetic regime on their own very border. And what's the border with North Korea to the north? Mostly it's China. Mm -hmm. And so the Chinese have a, um, they have a desire to keep the status quo. For them, that works. And in a sense, if you, as long as you're talking about a weak Korea, there's some comfort in that, putting up with the nonsense and all, as long as it's deemed by the Chinese not to be harmful to the world situation. If the Chinese ever came to the point where they thought it wasn't worth it to prop up the North regime, then stuff would start happening very quickly. But just, just clamping down on a few Chinese banks is a conservative approach, and I think that's Trump's approach. Symbolic. No, it's more than symbolic. It hurts them in the pocketbook. It, 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 in fact, they don't want it to be symbolic because they don't want it to be seen as a direct confrontation with the Chinese. They don't want that at all. But they want it to stop the coal shipments because that's a form of income uh, for the North Koreans. So they have to rely more on Pat Border visiting North Korea <laughs> to make money. Take money. <laughs> Well, I, I, I guess I would like to ask you finally, um, you know, how do you think this is going to play out in the real world? Um, you have s some unpredictable possibilities with the U.S., with Trump, and of course you have that, that Sly as a Fox unpredictability with uh, Kim Jong-un, and you have certain unpredictability with, with China, which operates in its own self-interest. Um, so how is it going to play out? Is, are we going to be in a kind of an uncomfortable stability here? Or is this going to move in one direction or another? I guess you've said it's not going to move dramatically into war and violence. That's not uh, going to happen. But, but where, which way is it going to go with all these three players all looking for, you know, advance their own interests, maintain stability, but also um, maintain a threat against the others? Ironically, it may boil down to financial issues. There are people in the economy right now who are predicting that things aren't rosy. If you turn on the financial shows in the morning, they all say the economy is growing uh, like gangbusters and um, they're cheerleaders for the existing system. If, if the system breaks down in the same way that it did in 2009, that could present the Chinese with real problems. I have read predictions that some of the buildings, uh, the tall buildings, the office buildings in Beijing won't be occupied for 25 years. Now, the government has been pulling in people from the provinces, people from uh, rural existence, in order to serve as workers uh, to build the economy. But the Chinese have an artificial economy. Um, it's, a, it's an artificial prosperity that uh, the government tells people build tall buildings, and so they're deemed to be needed, mm -hmm. even though they aren't. In America, if we build a tall building, it means that we need office space. In China, if they build a tall building, it means that um, it's, it's five-year planning, and uh, the five-year planning is always wrong. Uh, yeah. so, well, the, so, the, last, the last point, Pat, is, yeah. is this, and we we're really out of time here, but the last point is, um, you know, we've talked, and I've asked you before, to predict about reunification about the, um, you know, the forces that favor it and the forces that, that detract from it. Uh, and, I mean, it's a hope. Uh, we've had many discussions about this, about the possibility. Right now, today, after this, you know, this last few months under Trump and so, 
um, is it, I guess it's much less likely. It seems to me to be a receding possibility that the, that the North Koreans and the South Koreans will ever get together. You have a delight in asking me questions which you know I can't answer, and you're right, I can't answer it. Uh, what's the tipping point and how can it arrive? Um, there are external events which could make it happen and economic disaster could be one of them. Uh, a change in the military uh, position, no. I think that Trump is just enough of a, of a cowboy that he uh, might be interested in demonstrating to the world that he can f float his uh, carrier task force close to North Korea and they can't do anything about it. And that but, brings us to the end of our show, Pat. Okay. All right. We've enjoyed bringing it to you. I'm Jay Fidel. Our, our guest has been Pat Porter. We've been talking about North Korea threat or paper tiger. And we found that maybe DPRK is not so much a threat as we thought. Thanks to our production engineer, Ray Sangalang, our floor manager, Robert McLean, and all the people who care and contribute to our ThinkTech productions. If you want to see this show again, go to thinktechhawaii.com or youtube.com. Think Tech Hawaii, where there'll be a link to more shows just like this one. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. And we'll see Pat Border again to follow up on this story. Absolutely. And thank I thank you. you. Aloha.